Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for this LinkedIn Live event, discussion about digital health. Uh, attendees are going to be muted, but your questions are absolutely welcome and can be submitted through the chat feature on your screen throughout the afternoon today. So a little bit about HealthLink Advisors. We're a boutique advisory firm with deep big four experience, a growth mindset, and a focus on culture. Our diverse team of industry leaders maximizes client value by applying bold strategies to drive positive change. Our company focuses in the areas of clinical business and IT consulting for healthcare provider and payer organizations. And in the provider market, this includes a rapidly expanding base of health system clients across the US and globally, including our academic medical centers, integrated delivery health networks and community-based hospitals. We're proud to be top ranked by class in the strategic HIT advisory segment. And to learn more, please visit our website at healthlinkadvisors.com. I'm Tina Burbine, the VP of Care Innovation. Um, and I'm excited to join Lindsay Gerald today to get into uh, digital health and the relevancy of that in today's market. Um, my background includes 25 years of experience in value-based population health and IT data and analytics experience. And I'm excited uh, to bring together what I call the intersection is of data and analytics with care management and the implications that digital health has on that. Lindsay? Yeah, thanks, Tina. Uh, and I'm Lindsay Gerald, uh, CEO and co-founder of HealthLink Advisors. Uh, I've spent my entire career in uh, healthcare and healthcare technology, about half of that time on the provider side, serving in various roles, including CIO, um, and the other half in consulting, which, which I love, and uh, co-founded HealthLink Advisors about six and a half years ago, and uh, been enjoying serving uh, clients ever since. Um, I have a strong passion for healthcare, as I suspect many of you all do, for being in this business, uh, went into it early in my career as um, dear family members and have encountered the difficulties of navigating a healthcare system with a cancer diagnosis and uh, joined to make a difference. So I'm excited to be with you all today. And um, I know in some of the earlier marketing material that went out, we had another colleague that was gonna join us today, Chris Jenkins. Well, uh, Chris is not feeling well and was unable to join us for today, but. We'll keep pushing forward and we're certainly going to miss him and uh, his input in this call. You know, one of the things um, I'll, I'll also just reinforce, uh, Tina, I think to your earlier point, if you all have uh, questions or comments, we encourage you to put those in to the chat feature. Those are being monitored and folks will get them over to us as we go through this discussion. And look forward to having comments and feedback and questions come our way. I thought a good place for us to start uh, would be talking about the definition of what we mean by digital, both for the context of this conversation, but also from an industry perspective. You know, we, we see the word digital used a lot and in a lot of different contexts and to mean a lot of different things. And so as we often are talking to clients about what does digital mean to you? Or what do you mean by a digital journey? Or what's your goals around digital? We really have to spend a few minutes just talking about what we mean uh, by that or what they mean by that, right? Uh, sometimes it means that the organization is going to consolidate and rationalize technology in order to get more of a streamlined footprint. And that could be their definition of digital. Sometimes it's meant to describe a big CRM initiative, customer relationship management initiative that's ongoing, because that's a fundamental piece of the puzzle uh, for a bigger digital journey. And CRM becomes digital, right? And becomes uh, kind of takes on the definition of uh, digital. Sometimes uh, digital means a specialized team using human centered design to create software that improves the experience of a stakeholder. Right. And that's a robust uh, definition of digital where we're seeing organizations really go all in from a design and build and implementation uh, aspect of a digital tool. You know, when we think about digital and I think how we're going to talk about it in the context of this discussion, 
Uh, we're going to talk about human centered design. We're going to talk about cultural transformation. We're going to talk about digital tools. We're also going to talk about analytics and the importance of analytics supporting the digital journey. And we're going to talk a lot about stakeholder involvement. And you'll hear us use the term a lot constituents. So I know often constituents is used in a, a political context. That's not what we mean here. But constituents is an excellent broad term that really means all the stakeholders that touch the organization. Because we really have to have the constituents in mind when we think about what a digital journey means to an organization. So we'll stick in and around uh, in terms of what digital means to us and for the sake of this conversation. Um, we're going to be focusing, as I said, on the human centered design, on the transformation, on the digital tool set, whether you code it or whether you buy it off the shelf, um, and also really focusing in on the constituent side of things and how all that comes together in healthcare as uh, we think about um, our stakeholders, our customers, right? One of the things that um, I think we all know being in healthcare and uh, that we all have to think about is we're not just uh, dealing with customers and consumers like retail operations are. Uh, because our customers come from different areas and different aspects because sometimes our customers are introduced to us or our patients because we signed up with a new payer and we have a new contract with a payer and they're being directed to us. And so there, that's less about customer acquisition and capture. Uh, that's more about taking care of the patient once we're introduced to them. But there are certainly other aspects where we have to think about customer acquisition and retention. And we'll talk more about that as we um, kind of talk through our Venn diagram and think about um, what are the components of, of the digital journey. So I do want to start with um, digital in terms of the patient, Tina. And when we think about the delivery of healthcare, a lot of times digital conversations start around this as context, right? It could be that um, digital and the efforts around digital are used because we want to maintain wellness or we want to provide something to a population to allow them to track their health. Uh, or we want to provide tools to a family member that will allow them to track and manage another loved one's care. Could be access too, right? It could just be getting online scheduling access for someone um, so that they can more easily schedule appointments or that we can keep them in a referral network. Um, a lot of times that's where the digital conversation goes because it's such a high need in the industry. Um, and we've seen a lot of advancements in those areas, but there's still a lot of need. Um, you know, there we're seeing organizations have a lot of off the shelf product to advance digital maturity. Um, we'll talk about Epic in a little while. A lot of folks run Epic these days and depend on that core tool set that comes with Epic to really begin and accelerate their digital journey. Um, the other aspect of digital is healthcare is a business, right? Um, it's a business because we have to take care of our fiduciary responsibility to run the business and to be profitable so we can take care of the communities uh, that the organization serve, or in some cases uh, to the investors and the shareholders that um, uh, have invested into the organization. And so there we think about digital in terms of a robust digital marketing plan, right? How do we grow the business? Yeah. We think about customer acquisition and retention. We think about the cost of what it takes to find a customer, convert the customer and have them um, receive services from us. Um, and we think about things like cash, right? How important is it to use digital tools, enablement or efficiencies um, to increase cash collections or to drive down AR in the back end. So a lot of these things all intersect around that patient experience. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of this intersection, particularly around organiza when organizations are working on care transformation. 
and care transformation, you know, boy, did we really uh, see the industry accelerate the desire for true care transformation outside of the walls of the hospital when COVID really hit in the first wave. And we've seen that demand continue and organizations really work hard to say, what can I do to really transform care and take advantage of all the tools? Um, Tina, I know you and your team have been doing a lot of work in this area. Can you talk to us a little bit about the care transformation space and kind of the intersection of digital? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. You know, it's, it's I think, we've seen more change in the last two years and from the market pressure around all of us as well, as we've really started to drive more care into the home. Um, and when we think about that, well, how, how does digital play a role in all of that? And what does that really mean to our teams? And so I actually think about, you know, this word patient experience, in conjunction with what our internal teams are doing um, to influence that without even necessarily thinking about it and the patient not realizing just how much is happening behind the scenes to support them right so for instance you know if we've got an individual patient who um, isn't able to make it into a doctor's appointment and we've got the data behind that regularly so our care teams are aware of the fact that this individual is having a challenge getting into their appointments. You know, how are we using that information to connect somebody like a social worker role to create a better relationship with that patient? And that's going to help support them in making sure that they've got that added support to get into, whether it's a follow-up appointment, um, some added transitions of care support, whatever it might be and or also connected to other areas in the organization where maybe some um, uh, care at home services are available that enable them to take advantage of the virtual care options that might exist and can be integrated into whatever type of care plan that that patient may need. So when I think about all of these added care delivery um, pathways that our teams have really focused on over the last two years, we now you know, regularly see from an operations perspective, large virtual care teams that have been stood up to support our patients. And how do those teams play a part in all of the different care coordination that's happening behind the scenes for our patients to make sure that we're all connected and supporting that patient the best way we can. And it all comes back to what kind of tool sets do we have in our hands, the data sharing between the teams and the information that makes its way into that into the hands of the patient as well and vice versa. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, I'm going to key in on, on something you just said there, you know, to ensure we're all connected. Boy, is there a lot of ways to play off of that? Uh, a little bit later when we talk to you all about really the journey, right? The, the steps as we see them to digital maturity. Um, we're going to talk more about that. Are we all connected? Um, I want to use analytics, I think, to kind of double click on that point and talk about connectedness and all, and all its different ways and what it means. Um, and, you know, to bring analytics into the digital work here, uh, I'm not necessarily talking about analytics um, that we use and pursue in order to improve clinical decision making about a patient, right? I want to talk about analytics that directly support the digital investment and the digital work that's going on in the organization. So let me tell you a little bit about what I often hear um, in just conversations and catching up with people throughout the industry. I often hear organizations talk about what they've accomplished in historical terms around digital. Um, and it comes uh, quite often with some of these statistics, right? Sometimes it's the number of telemedicine visits that we did last month or the last six months. Um, sometimes it's the number of online appointments that were booked for a physician office uh, last month or a year ago compared to, to today. Sometimes it's the amount of money we collect up front in the um, outpatient imaging uh, center for a copay or for the physician practice for a copay compared to what we did before. And that's understandable because a lot of organizations have invested in digital or been on a journey already, and they've seen significant improvement in those areas, uh, to use those as examples. 
So it's normal um, to think about that and quote that to demonstrate progress and to demonstrate value in the investments that have been made. But I want to challenge the, the leaders on the call to think about, you know, let's flip that a little bit and let's think about specific goals that we need to be chasing um, because of the digital investment. And here's what I mean by that. Um, how many telemedicine visits do you want a month? And how does that number integrate with the strategy that, that um, is urging forth physician office growth and acquisition or the strategy that is opening more um, outpatient imaging centers, right? Because if that's not working together and the digital team who has a to-do to grow telemedicine and make it easier and integrate that into more clinical pathways, if all those goals don't work together and tie together um, from growth goals of your physical assets, then the organization is ultimately going to be uh, working against each other, right? To quote an old saying my mom used to say, it'd be uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, another good example, how many online appointments do we want scheduled through our digital tool set, right? So we brought up a new app, we brought up a new portal, we brought up a new capability, we built new interfaces, and we're talking about the success of online scheduling but how many do we want? How many do we want? And is that integrated with the new call center that another VP is putting together to grow call center volume, to have a higher touch that way? Do those strategies complement each other? And is the digital team pursuing the outcome of how many we want, not how many we had? We need to be thinking more proactive uh, in those Point of service collection, uh, again, probably another easy example, uh, but what is success in terms of point of service collection? Um, how do we measure success? And does access define the, the, does the access team define success with point of service collections the same way the revenue cycle team does? So if we think about moving to more of a proactive how have we geared the digital team to be fully in the business and pursuing the same strategies or goals that the operators that are running the health system are pursuing? I think those kinds of compliments um, can really pay off. You know, once again, we just sometimes see where uh, there are independent strategies going on. We must build and promulgate our digital tool set and there's an investment stream going on there there's also an investment stream going on into growing physical assets and building more exam rooms. And there's a, a the third that I used before about the call center. Now, all of those may be complementary to each other. That would be dependent on the market, but sometimes they're not, and they're actually working against each other. So we need to be really thoughtful when we think about digital strategy and how it ties into organizational strategy. Um, you know, Population health, oh my gosh, have we seen just a lot of investment and a lot of work going on around population health and really trying to understand what tools are available, remote patient monitoring, uh, using uh, IoT as a backbone to think about how we get people connected, and also apps, right, getting apps on a smartphone. But then how does everyone have access to that? Does everyone have access to that in the markets that our providers are serving? Um, Tina, I know you and your team, again, been doing work in this area around um, health equity and thinking about how we get uh, the right tools into the hands of patients in different communities. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. You know, it's so important that as we're designing any kind of designing or expanding um, either new care delivery pathways or supplementing and strengthening existing ones, that we're keeping in mind, you know, what are the socioeconomic conditions of the patients that we're worried about? And what are the solutions that are going to best fit their needs? Um, because it's very easy for all of us who might be carrying a smartphone day to day to think, oh, this app is just going to work consistently for everybody. Um, and, and really, it's important to take a step back in the planning process and very carefully look at 
the patient population types that a team is surveying in your geographic area and to localize the care delivery plan so that your tool sets from a digital experience perspective are mapped to support each, each of the patient population types that the organization is working with. Um, and that could mean creating you know, a roadmap with a variety of things to enhance their digital experience, right? It could be that there's an application that for some individuals is going to collect um, certain data points while they're at home enrolled at a care at home program, where other patients might be provided with a package of technology during the time that they're enrolled in any kind of care at home program. So, and it's okay to be able to offer a plan that's going to support the patient um, and meet them with their needs so that the care team supporting them are being provided and are able to communicate uh, with them around the meaningful information that's going to make a difference, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, in the example of say remote patient monitoring, you know, it could be that a CHF patient um, being sent home with some equipment needs to be able to communicate more than just your standard vital sign information. Um, that's especially important if we're trying to keep somebody at home and stable who's battling CHF, um, along with other conditions they may have like COPD and asthma simultaneously. And so it's really important that, you know, we may have to think beyond just a, a typical app and connection to my chart if that kind of connectivity is not available for that individual patient and being able to have a solution, you know, that we can make sure they're safely at home and providing meaningful information back to our care teams who are, who are working with them around the clock, really. Um, because remember, that's another aspect of all of this type of care that's really important to keep in mind. We're no longer confined to the eight to five operational appointments that, you know, historically we've been used to. Now with this digital integration, we can be in touch with the patients we're caring for almost around the clock. Um, and that really makes a difference to the things that we're all very focused on these days, like you know, reducing readmissions and focusing on the transitions of care, because it always seems, at least from, especially from my personal experience, that when something gets escalated in terms of a health condition, it always seems to be outside of the normal working daily hours, right? When we really need to get in touch with somebody on our care team. So having the, the digital information enabled through packages that make sense for them um, can can make a difference not only to their experience but also to the care teams helping to support them you know a uh, journey mapping is something we're going to talk about here in a little bit but i want to go ahead and bring that up because as i just think about the example you just gave right and so journey mapping that um, experience of that heart patient who needs to be monitored at home that doesn't have access right and I know you all have been talking a lot lately about equity and how we think about really getting digital equity for all the different populations out there so that they have connectivity, they have um, the tools. I just love that term equity, but journey mapping, which we're gonna talk more about in a minute, we need to think about that patient's journey, right? And, and what does the digital investment mean to them, not just the, um, you know, the populations that we understand to have access and that we understand can do online appointment scheduling. I see uh, many digital investments fall short in this area. And hey, we're not throwing stones, right? Uh, we can only imagine what it's like to work in the operating pressures that hospital and physician's offices are working under today. Um, but, you know, we want to be thoughtful. We want to be sure this is done right. And so, having the team to go out and connect with, you know, those constituents as we call them, right? And do that journey mapping is really an important aspect. Um, and you get a lot more out of it than just installing off the shelf software, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the other thing that comes to mind, Lindsay, as I hear you talk about that, that journey map is really thinking broadly about all of the different types of information that we're able to get our hands on across a health organization and how to marry that between the, like I call it, the virtual and the physical experience of a patient. 
So for instance, you know, if we have in a CRM, the fact that, you know, a, a patient happens to be a dog owner because they may have made a, a donation to something that the health organization was supporting locally, that we can take that information and share it with our clinicians. Um, and if that individual happens to be in front of their PCP and they're not moving as much, you know, there's the connection to, hey, we know that historically um, you've been out walking your dog twice a day. And now let's talk about the fact that you're not doing that as frequently, what's really going on, right? So it's another connection to the type of lifestyle information that's really meaningful to that patient that prompts a more meaningful, personalized discussion from their care team as well. Yeah, it sure does. That's a great point. And back right back to integrating the strategies, right? Are we are we Absolutely. building out care teams that, you know, are not fully at the table, so to speak, with our digital strategy and how the investments are going? Absolutely. You know, we'll often bring up this slide when we're just starting to talk about um, digital or a digital strategy or, um, you know, maybe folks have been on a digital journey for a few years, but they're questioning the value out of it, right? It's just been kind of more about projects and it's been about overall value. And we love this Venn diagram because it allows us in broad categories to kind of separate out, but also show the alignment that must take place here. You know, marketing strategy, um, that's intuitive to so many of us who have been in technology or been around business. But uh, while we think it's intuitive, you can't replace the marketing job with a technology leader. Uh, you know, we have to have marketing completely at the table helping to drive this strategy and lead this way, it was, especially as we think about digital marketing. Uh, you know, a simple example, which, which I love here, just to, to drive the point home is, if a patient is in your primary secondary uh, service area and they Google nearest hospital or they Google uh, chest pain system, symptoms or heart attack symptoms, um, are you owning that experience from the minute that Google pops up? And if you're not, you ought to be asking yourself why you're not, because that's about customer acquisition, management and intake, and also can certainly help them have a better clinical outcome. Um, so, you know, that is just a microcosm example of how rich a digital marketing strategy needs to be, not to mention all the other things that need to go into it. Um, but I think the digital officer and the marketing officer, you know, really need to be hand, uh, hand in hand in terms of how they're moving forward. Um, technology enablement. Uh, oh, my gosh, do we have uh, just a, a lot of experiences here? You know, one of the things I wanted to point out here is a lot of organizations have invested in digital leadership. Uh, sometimes that's in the form of a digital officer and the digital officer will arrive with um, so many plans and so excited and so much energy because they see the opportunity in healthcare. And then they're met when they step across the uh, threshold with 15 years of technology debt that the organization has accumulated for itself. So where do they start? What do they do, right? How do they move forward if everything that they want to do or want to drive forward is hindered by the technology debt that the organization has created? Um, and that's not to throw stones at the organization, right? It's just um, a lot of times the nature of how healthcare has been run with the limited IT investment streams. Finally, uh, we've already mentioned constituent experience, um, you know, to run the list, right? Um, patients that we want to have, patients that we do have, patients that we used to have, families of patients, uh, physicians, all of our employees and all their different roles, our business partners, our vendors, uh, those are ultimately uh, our constituents and likely more. Um, but how is our digital investment addressing our constituents? Because if it's trying to address all of those constituents at the same time, your investment strategy is broken. Um, there needs to be prioritization around those and an understanding of how we're building that kind of multi-layered cake, if you will, how we're building on one investment after another uh, to ultimately really enrich um, the constituent experience. 
we believe those conversations, you know, come together uh, around a digital strategy and show the integration and how important it is to have that tied into capital funds flow or operating funds flow into the overall organizational uh, strategy. Um, you know, one of the things I uh, really enjoy is watching Tina and her team work in, um, on engagements and engaging with clients. And one of the reasons that I like that so much is because I know they're going to focus on what is the problem we're trying to solve. And, um, you know, we, we want to emphasize that here in this discussion. What is the problem we're trying to solve when we're using the term digital? Back to the prioritization, we need to be able to have uh, our problem well defined. We need to have the right governance groups at the table. And by the way, governance representation will change depending on what problem we're trying to solve overall as we move forward. But I think that's really important because if we're trying to solve that care transformation challenge, Tina, and we think about all the different things we're gonna ask folks in the ED to think about, right? when someone presents who's identified as someone that has been under care from the primary care doctor and who likes to come to the ED uh, because they don't take their meds, right? All these kind of typical scenarios, we're going to ask people to work differently. So if we don't have those folks at the table in governance or in work groups, I think it's unrealistic for us to expect them to act differently. Um, I think it's also important for the digital team members, and you'll you'll see this when we talk a little bit about the steps, um, it, for the digital team members to be at the table, to be journey mapping, to be sitting beside the nurse in the ED, um, by the triage nurse, to sit in a call center, to sit next to um, a home health nurse or representative as they're out in the field, right? Uh, you know, I know you you and your team have had experience that. Talk to us a little bit about that, right? We, we've got to get out there and get with our internal customers. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, going back to a comment you made about governance, you know, making sure that we're listening to our clinical leaders describe what it is that they're trying to provide to patients, I think helps really outline first and make sure, you know, we're all sitting around the table with the same understanding of what kind of enhanced care delivery pathway are we talking about? Um, and then from there, working through that journey map to say, okay, under in order to deliver those things, you know, these are the six things that are the foundational elements that we need to make sure are in place to do that. And that's really a combination of everything we're talking about here. It's you know, the technology enablement, but also what workflows do we need and who do we need to be involved and how are we going to connect in those team members internally to support every, you know, all of those steps that that patient is going to experience. Um, there's a, as Lindsay, as I was listening to you, you know, I, for some reason, immediately thought about this patient experience where we put so much effort into changing the registration and intake process, right? Somebody walks in the door to, um, to their physician's office. If I'm a mom bringing my, my daughter or son in, and I did some of the electronic registration online, I walk in the door, I think we're ready to go. And then there's 20 more things that I have to answer on paper because for some reason there's a component that's not integrated and not even see that. I mean, I think we've all experienced that. Um, and so it's thinking through a, not only what is the, the defined care delivery program that we're trying to, to strengthen, but also what are the underlying 20 steps that need to take place? What are the workflow changes we need to make? And then what's the education we have to provide to the team members that are going to be involved in that? Um, because I do mm -hmm. see this, the communication and the education internally, just as important as it is to the patient uh, communication and education that they're receiving as well through this process. Yeah. So I want to just double click on this a little bit more and bring it home because, you know, a lot of times when consultants are talking about governance and journey mapping and workflow, we can really get into it. 
Um, and I like to just bring that down and say, okay, practically, what do we mean, right? So uh, let's say we're an Epic hospital and we have my chart. And we've been uh, thinking a lot about utilizing some more my chart functionality because we can see what other Epic customers are doing and they look like they're having good success. And we, we want to uh, be in more contact and make it easier for our patients and also have a healthier business. So we're considering uh, that we want to move forward and turn on open schedule and that we want to really utilize some of the new functionality in my chart around propensity to pay and upfront cash collections. Now, this is digital work, right? Um, but we're not building our own software tool. We're not uh, going out running a system selection. We're not going to use an agile methodology uh, to turn something on likely. But this is really important digital work as we think about consumer experience and all of those things. I think what we're saying, Tina, is do we understand, have we got out of the committee meeting and just gone and sat with, if we move to open schedule, how does that impact our docs? How does that impact physician office access reps? How does it impact the MA? How does it impact the patient? How does it impact the family? Right. We need to go sit and walk a mile or, or sit and walk a mile in their shoes um, so that, to your point, we better understand the education and communication that needs to take place so that can be turned on because that that is a huge shift often for physician culture. Um, the other thing around point of service collections, right? Um, have we often asked people to pay on arrival? Um, well, there's so many good tools around now informing them before arrival and getting them to agree to put a credit card in, talking specifically about some Epic functionality. Um, but we need to go interview patients and understand how that impacts them and how it needs to be communicated to. I think that's, we just see that missing a lot, right? We see it more like turning some software on and rolling out a communication plan. And when we're thinking about the interaction with these constituents, we need to be really thoughtful around that, right? Absolutely. And there are so many nuances to our, you know, front end clinical workflows that it's so important to take, take a minute and understand, well, here are the 20 things we're actually worried about in this interaction that we need to account for. And maybe there's a way we can simplify that. Maybe there's a way we can deal with a smoother handoff, whatever it might be. But it's really important to make sure we all understand what are those 20 things that are happening in a two to three minute time frame. Um, yeah. you know, that make a difference for everyone else's experience um, for the follow-up steps after that. All right, well, let's keep rolling forward here. I see we've got a couple of questions um, that have come in as well. So why don't we try to knock some of those off and then we'll get a little closer to just kind of laying out uh, the journey and, and wrap people up to give them a break before their next meeting. Um, so I'm looking here, is digital health a new concept? Uh, I don't think digital is a new concept, Tina. I'd love your answer to that too. You know, I, we've just been talking about it for so long in healthcare, um, because it's needed, but also we often don't have the investment stream to put in it to solve it. So it stays a goal year after year. I think there's a ton of work to still do in terms of, uh, digital experience and digital build out, uh, in healthcare. Um, but it's not new. I, I was telling somebody a story the other day. Um, we watched Pirates of the Caribbean 2 um, on vacation this summer, and I believe that was released in 2004. We watched it on a DVD, if you can believe it, and a DVD player. <laughs> and um, before Disney launched the movie, they were inviting us to join the Disney Club in 2004 um, and send them an email so they could capture our name, our email address, and what movies we like. They would give us some reward points, and then, you know, they would have us captured in their CRM. And I thought to myself, what a great example 20 years ago of just a simple digital capture to begin that digital interaction. We know now, of course, that's moved all online. Um, but I was reminded how long we've been thinking about digital and consumer interaction as one example. Um, you know, how, how about you? Is digital new to a lot of the care teams that you work with or are people kind of expecting it? 
Definitely uh, not new. And yes, I would say that, you know, we've settled into um, starting to use more um, digital tool sets, whether that's, you know, various applications or real-time information. I definitely think that's a norm now. I think that teams still struggle, though, to take action timely enough on that information and to have workflows that are meaningful, right? In other words, meaningful steps that are going to make a difference based on that information as well. You know, saying I love uh, Tina, that you just reminded me of just in those few comments is um, most data insights die in the last mile. You know, we have these analytics teams and tools and they work so hard to capture the right information and get it in the right dashboard on the right medium in front of the right person. And then action's not taken, right? Yeah. Um, and that, wow, does that apply to it in a lot of different areas? Um, we could probably do another webinar just on that right there. Um, but you know, that's your point is so well made, right? We we've got to be able to take action if we're if we're making all these investments to capture and manage. Absolutely. And it's marrying, you know, our, our wor workflow design with the digital planning that's happening. Um, right. I can't say right. enough how important that is to success. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I want to get to, um, you know, the steps that we see, the major uh, steps that we see on a digital journey. Um, so let's kind of talk through those and uh, Tina, please jump in here as I kind of roll through these. But as we think about a digital journey, right? And what are the characteristics we see and what is needed to have a successful digital journey to maturity? Uh, so our first one is an agile organization. And uh, we don't specifically mean the agile methodology, although it's often very helpful, uh, especially if you're doing internal development. Um, but an agile organization, because of all the things we've been talking about, it takes stakeholders, internal stakeholders at the table, willing to get out of their comfort zone to rethink interactions for customers and patients and physicians. And um, it, you know, agile that they're, they're willing to have those conversations and embrace the change. And I think I've been in healthcare long enough to know change doesn't come easy to us. Uh, especially when we're uh, noodling around with the patient caregiver interaction. So um, an agile organization that, and that has to come from the top and be sponsored from the top. The second thing that we want to see is clear unmet needs. We don't uh, want to see, and we help our organizations that we work with, not just invest in digital because digital is a good idea. Right. What are clear unmet needs that we're trying to solve that can be measured for success and that can also be declared a success and moved on to the next? So we have constant iterative pr improvement, uh, you know, reminder back. What are we asking the digital team to achieve? How can they enable the business setting specific business goals? Um, you know, alignment around strategic spend. Uh, really got to be thinking about a three to five year spend commitment, both on a capital and operating basis in order to enable uh, digital work, digital investment, digital resources. Um, in our view, if it's possible, digital should not be contemplated in a year to year capital ranking exercise, right? There needs to be um, a three to few, five year commit made. Certainly that can be ranked and adjusted a little bit as time goes on, uh, but that commitment can then be managed by the right governance group as they prioritize against the clear unmet needs. Uh, the skills and tools to execute on digital plans, so hiring the right resources, getting the right people, finding the right tool sets. Tools could be because you're gonna develop software in-house um, which is certainly doable. And there has been organizations that have seen great value out of that around the digital footprint area um, or uh, pursuing off the shelf software. It still must meet an unmet need and be measurable, um, but we need to have the right tools um, and ability to execute on that digital plan and the, and the people skills to do it. So we've talked about human centered design. That's the next one, right? Human centered design experience and the willingness to use it. Um, 
we've been talking about journey mapping. We've been talking about walking a mile in the customer's shoes, been talking about spending time with the customers. Uh, those are vital components to getting it to work right and to seeing that ROI, because then when, when it's released, whether it's new workflow or new tools, uh, the adoption rate can be much higher. And we've really got to be talking about that human centered design aspect, even if it's designing around off the shelf software, really important aspect of a successful digital program and reinventing uh, the interactions. Um, we often see these uh, led by a dedicated digital leader. And, you know, we believe that's necessary and it needs to, you need to have a digital leader. Doesn't have to be a chief digital officer, could be a director of digital, right? The point is um, that, digital leader in our eyes needs to be one focused on outcomes and on the customer, not on building the next best software with the team they're leading. Um, the technical skills can be achieved, but you know, the digital leader really needs to be customer focused and understanding how we drive value out of that interaction. Um, analytics and the skill to use um, and output and improve the overall process. So we've touched on analytics here. We've given you all a few examples of that. Um, but, you know, the proper use of analytics to measure success and also to walk away from investments when they don't work, when they don't prove themselves out. There's often important lessons to be learned there. Um, but let's use analytics to drive the value of, of those investments and to iterate and improve. So uh, an agile organization, unmet needs, organizational support and alignment to strategic spend, the skills and the tools to execute, human-centered design principles, a digital leader focused on the customer, and uh, the use of analytics to continually iterate and declare success or failure. As we've worked with um, clients, uh, you know, really all over the U.S. and talked with them about the digital journey and making that transformation, those are the key elements that we see really make a strong difference. Sometimes it does come out of IT. Sometimes it comes this so much of this work comes out of IT when it's really well integrated with the business. And sometimes it comes out of business and they're pushing IT and trying to get the quote IT organization to keep up. So. Tina, comments on that? I realize I ran through that pretty fast. Didn't mean to steal, steal anything from you. I, I think the, the other lesson learned that, you know, we find ourselves talking a lot about, Lindsay, is just remaining empathetic and making sure that we're keeping the patients that we're serving and all of our local markets in mind, um, because it's so exciting to be thinking about new, you know, ways that we can integrate the technology that we're now able to get our hands on, but we need to make sure that we're empathetic and that we're keeping in mind, you know, the experiences and that equity that you mentioned earlier that matters to everybody, you know, maintaining fair access um, as well. Um, I, I see we've got a question. Why don't we do one more question and then just kind of wrap up, uh, give people a few, few minutes back. Um, there's a question that came in. It says, what are some, what are some of the challenges organizations experience when migrating to digital? Um, well, too bad we don't have another hour. Uh, I'll start with one and throw it over to you. If you want to, uh, talk about it, Tina, um, I, what immediately comes to, to mind based on, um, the interactions I have with my team who are doing a lot of work with customers is, of fascination with a tool, or I'll call it vendor-driven strategy, right? Um, someone learns about a new tool and is convinced by the vendor's pitch or by maybe the tool itself that that's absolutely needed. That becomes a high priority strategy and it's pursued and the label digital gets attached to it. And, you know, if asked about that strategy 90 days ago, um, there would not have been a strategy around that. It's the tool that really created the strategy that caused fascination with the tool that caused everybody to focus on it. Um, I see that as a challenge that a lot of organizations deal with. Heck, I've done that when I worked in healthcare organizations, right? So it, um, I think it, we just have to be conscious of it and use good governance to ask the question so we get a little bit of a reality check to say, are we really driving strategy here or are we chasing a tool? 
Um, Tina, how about you? Yeah, I think the the other thing that comes to mind is integration, right? So, um, and what I mean by that is there's a decision made about a tool that we know is going to serve our, our plan and strategy really well. Let's make sure that we have everybody on the same page about when the work to integrate that and cut down on whatever manual workflows might be happening until that integration work is finished is planned for. Because I think this is another great example where you know you need to not only make sure that your digital plans are well outlined, but that that's integrated with the care delivery pathway work that's happening, um, marketing, patient experience, all of those things remain aligned um, so that you are gaining value. Um, from investing in these things. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, Tina, thanks for your time today. And thanks everybody who joined us. Uh, Certainly had a lot of fun talking about uh, the digital journey. We hope that this has been helpful uh, to you all. And um, please follow up with us. If uh, you have any additional thoughts or questions or feedback, we sure would appreciate it. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Lindsay.